Hello, welcome, welcome, welcome. Happy to have you as you join in today. We'll be talking a lot about supporting young people who are impacted by bullying with some amazing practitioners, researchers, facilitators, um, youth development masters. So thank you so much, all of you who are coming in and joining us here at Mentor. As you come in, please let us know in the chat where you're calling in from, what state, what city, maybe you're um, outside the US, let us know where you're, where you're coming from today, um, just so we can get a sense of um, all of you who are here with us. We have people from Nebraska, from Kansas, from California, North Carolina, Indiana, Iowa, awesome, California. This is awesome. We have people from all over. So as you come in, just let us know where you're calling in from. Welcome, welcome. We're gonna get started. So participating in today's webinar, um, please make sure you're muted throughout the webinar. We do have two ways of participating. So if you do have a key question that comes up for our panelists or our researchers, please try to use the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And you can type in the exact question that you'd like um, to ask. We're gonna try to get to questions if we, if we have time. We do have a big conversation to have today. So, but we do keep those questions, even if we don't get to them um, and try to respond to those through our follow-up emails. If you have comments or experiences that you wanna share throughout the webinar, feel free to use the chat. The chat is also on the bottom left of your screen. Um, so the chat is really for um, you know, supporting your colleagues who are here with us today also, and anything that you'd like to let us know or issues you're having throughout. Uh, we also do have live captions with the, the CC at the bottom of the screen. Um, so feel free to use that if you would like. We are gonna launch some polls to just find out more about all of you and your experiences. Um, we wanna make sure that we're kind of tailoring everything we talk about today to, to all of you. Um, so yeah, just really engage with us through these, these methods. Um, within a week, you will receive uh, a PDF of this whole presentation. So uh, if you'd like to share it, um, with colleagues, feel free. And we'll also be posting this on our website, the NMRC, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Uh, we have a tight agenda today. We have a lot we wanna cover. We're gonna have two incredible research researchers um, give us a really good overview about bullying um, and get, get a lot of insights into all the background of bullying. We're going to then have an in-depth conversation with um, experts and mentoring programs about this subject. And we will try to get to your questions. Um, again, we have, we do have a long conversation we wanna have, uh, but we will try to try to get to your questions. So the NMRC is a project that's funded through OJJDP, which is the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the Office of Justice Programs and the US Department of Justice. And the National Mentoring Resource Center, this is something that is run through Mentor right now. It is a website. We have a ton of free resources for mentoring, mentoring programs, um, mentors on that website. We have a blog where we share, where mentoring programs share a lot of personal stories. Um, and we, we post really detailed pro, um, evidence reviews, articles, um, resources and research about mentoring in all different um, types of topics. So feel free to check that out. It's nationalmentoringresourcecenter.com. And we have a research board that is constantly updating that information and adding to it. And we do offer technical assistance for free to mentoring programs across, across the country. So we'll let you know more about how to apply for that at the end of the webinar. So we wanna know more about all of you. Uh, we're gonna launch our first poll and if you can just let us know, what is your role in mentoring? Are you a mentor yourself? Are you program staff? Are you a funder? Are you a mentee? Just let us know. It looks like we have, all right, awesome. Yeah, mentors, researchers, 
let us know your role in mentoring and then we'll, we'll look at the results. It looks like we have about half of you who are program staff and about 17% of you are mentors, amazing. And then we have lots of other roles, which is great, 20% of you. And then some of you um, are just liking to learn more about mentoring in this topic specifically. Awesome, okay. And our next question. Um, so we just wanna know if you are seeing that the young people you're working with are impacted by bullying currently or are engaging in bullying behavior. Um, are you noticing this? Um, you know, that your youth are impacted in either direction. So it looks like yes. Um, from your responses, just let us, yet, let us know yes, no, or if you're not sure um, whether the young people that you're in closest contact with through your work are, are impacted by bullying. And we'll share out the results. So yeah, it looks like about three quarters of you are certain that the young people you're working with are being impacted by bullying in some way right now. So it'll be really, we really hope that this conversation today is, is helpful and supportive and we'll be sharing more resources beyond this as well. So we just have one more question to know more about where all of you are coming from today. Um, how prepared are you all feeling to deal with bullying when it comes up for young people? Whether they are being bullied or whether they are bullying others. Do you feel very prepared? Do you feel somewhat prepared? Do you feel not prepared at all? Or are you kind of not really sure where to begin on this, on this topic right now? Just take a couple seconds to, to answer that question. And we'll look at the results. Um, so it looks like a lot of you are feeling somewhat prepared. 68% of you are feeling somewhat prepared and just a few of you are, fe are feeling very prepared. So we have a range, about 10% of you are not feeling very prepared at all to deal with this. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of different experiences in the room for this, for this webinar today. So thank you for that, because this is just gonna help us with our conversation. Um, so thank you for that participation. So I'd love to introduce our moderators. We have Tim Cavell, professor in the Department of Psychological Sciences at the University of Arkansas. And we have Chris Elledge, professor of psychology at the University of Tennessee. These um, two amazing researchers are going to share a lot of um, really valuable background information research and examples to get us started on this topic. And then we will launch into a conversation with our panelists. So I will hand it over to Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martha. Um, welcome everyone. Um, I feel <clears throat> kind of honored and privileged to be uh, able to be one of the moderators on a uh, panel discussion of a topic I feel so passionate about. Um, so today I wanted to, we wanted to start off by just uh, providing kind of a brief overview on bullying uh, and some of the uh, research on the topic, uh, as well as talk about some of um, our own research, uh, looking at the efficacy of youth mentoring for both aggressive and bullied children, and then maybe end with, um, uh, some recommendations um, for everyone to consider. <clears throat> so uh, bullying kind of, when, when you think about bullying, I guess it might be best conceptualized as a subcategory or a subtype of ag aggressive behavior. And um, generally it's defined as uh, aggressive behavior that is intentionally harmful. It's, uh, it's, it's repeated over time, and it often occurs, or, or one of the requirements is that it occurs in a context of an actual or perceived imbalance of power. And when we, when we say that, the, the, the imbalance between the bully and the victim could be in terms of physical strength, but 
but it also may be in terms of uh, social power. Now, peer victimization or bullying victimization is a term um, that describes the experience of, of the victim. And generally we define bullying victimization as um, a youth's repeated exposure to interactions that are harmful, they convey harmful intent. These interactions produce harmful effects and they're often sanctioned by the peer group um, in which bystanding is, is more normative than intervening. And, and I'll say, um, um, so for example, when you, uh, if you talk to children about uh, whether or not bullying is, is an acceptable behavior at school, almost all of them universally will say, no, this is, this is a terrible thing, it should not be done. However, if you observe uh, interactions on the playground or uh, in the hallways or in the lunchrooms, uh, you might see bullying behavior. And uh, when you observe the behaviors of the broader peer group, you might notice um, a lot of children standing around and doing nothing. And so we see um, kind of this belief that children hold that bullying behavior is, is not acceptable. Um, but their behaviors don't often align with, with those sorts of beliefs. So for most youth, um, when you look at uh, international studies on the prevalence of uh, peer victimization or bullying, for most youth, bullying is a relatively transitory experience. And, uh, you know, roughly, on average, about 30% of children um, will report experiencing some form of bullying over time. But uh, a much smaller percentage, for a much smaller, smaller percentage of youth, uh, bullying is a much more chronic experience. And if you look across studies internationally, you know, prevalence estimates vary between about nine and 12%. So about nine and 12% are experiencing chronic victimization. And for those children, there are um, greater risks associated with that sort of experience. So chronic victims, um, so when you look at uh, both cross-sectional research and longitudinal research, so this is data collected at a single time point or across time, you often see that children who are victims of uh, chronic peer victimization are more likely to report feeling isolated or lonely. Um, they don't like to go to school. They present with symptoms, anxiety or depression. And they, um, um, in more extreme cases, may report suicidal ideation or engage in suicidal behaviors. And then for, for um, as you transition into middle school or adolescence, you see chronic victims um, may, may turn to abusing substances as well. And then in the most extreme cases, the combination of both chronic victimization and emotional problems um, may result in some, um, some youth uh, be kind of being a danger to themselves or to others. So what are we doing for these children? The, the vast majority of research on um, bullying prevention has focused on the development and evaluation of school-wide anti-bullying programs. And so these are, these are intervention or prevention programs that are implemented universally um, in school systems or at a particular school. And there are, there are generally three common components that cut across these uh, school-wide anti-bullying programs. So first is there's this kind of um, school-wide anti-bullying campaign, which is meant to change the norms or the culture of the school around um, bullying issues, specifically and more broadly about how do we treat others? How do we treat our peers um, at school? Second, um, there are usually policies or uh, rules imposed by the administration or by teachers at the classroom level um, against bullying behavior and, uh, and then also implementing consequences for the perpetration of bullying. And then lastly, uh, schools often uh, improve the extent to which they're monitoring bullying hotspots. And these, these are areas like the playground, um, the lunchroom, the hallways, uh, the bus line. Um, and, and as you can imagine, traditionally, these are areas where there's um, much less adult uh, supervision. So when these programs are implemented 
uh, fully and with fidelity, we generally see a 30 to 50% overall reduction in the rates of, of, of bullying. Interestingly, however, in US schools, there are very few schools that are implementing evidence-based anti-bullying programs. Now, most districts and most schools uh, do have anti-bullying policies, um, but again, very few are actually implementing these evidence-based programs. When they are implemented, we, we often see that over time, um, the program effects fade, um, and that may be due to the fact that schools um, over a period of years uh, stop fully implementing the intervention or are implementing it um, with less fidelity. And more and interestingly, more, more recently, there's been some work that is, that's come out that's shown that when you reduce the overall rates of victimization at schools, um, we see this kind of, it's called the healthy context paradox, where um, as we reduce the overall victimization rates in schools, those children who remain victims become more visible and they're more severely targeted. And so um, there may be some iatrogenic effects that we, we may need to consider when implementing these, um, these school-based bullying prevention programs. And Tim, so um, uh, Tim is our other moderator for this discussion. And so I'll let Tim jump in here. He's gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the peer related factors that might um, maintain victimization. I think Tim might be having a little trouble joining us, um, but we could, should we move forward a little bit? No, I can I can take over here, Tim. If you're not if you're not here, I'll I'll just move us along. Um, so interestingly, so as I as I mentioned in one of the first first slides of um, this this part of the presentation, um, you know, when you observe uh, children on the playgrounds or in or in large groups, you often uh, see a norm of non-intervention. And so we have lots of good kids who are choosing to um, kind of disengage from um, um, episodes of bullying. You know, they're not defending, they're not, they're not helping, helping victims. And so I think, um, uh, so bullying is more than a dyadic process. Bullying involved is, is a collective action by the peer group. And so, you know, if, if, if children, um, if victimized, you know, if children are um, considered different or disliked and they're stigmatized, then it becomes, um, um, it may be the case that peers are, are kind of reluctant to interact and engage with uh, these disliked peers for fear that they may cause damage to their own social reputation. And um, these peers kind of buy into this shared story about, about the victimized youth, that they're disliked, that there's, there's something different about them. That, um, um, and so they, they buy into this shared narrative. And um, these kind of established anti-bullying norms uh, don't extend to these social misfits. So, you know, kids have these general idea, has, have these, has the general idea, excuse me, children, generally believe that bullying is not an acceptable behavior. But those ideas don't extend to these children who are considered social misfits. Thus, it frees up kind of good kids um, to engage in behaviors that they might not otherwise engage in without this moral cost. But you know, helping, helping chronic victims is challenging. Um, can be challenging. Um, you know, it's it's not uncommon for uh, children who are children who are chronically victimized to, to kind of occupy this victim role. They develop you know cognitions around uh, the experience of being victimization uh, being victimized. Um, they may start to blame themselves for being bullied, um, and it's also not uncommon for for even chronic victims to be very reluctant to ask help. And I, I think this happens because the thought is, is that when children 
um, reach out for help, and that may be to a teacher, to a parent, that they may fear that it makes the situation worse. And so if I reach out, um, the child who is bullying me or the group of children who are bullying me uh, may become aware of that. And then um, this may lead to uh, an increase in chronicity or severity of, of, of the bullying experiences. Um, so this, this is kind of a, a, I think this illustrates one of the, one of the challenges we face when helping chronically victimized children. And so this is taken from a uh, scene from, from the movie Bully. So the mother says, friends are supposed to make you feel good. Your only connection to these kids is that they like to pound on you. And the son says, if you say these people aren't my friends, then what friends do I have? So, um, as I mentioned previously, the majority of intervention work um, around the prevention of bullying has happened at the whole school level. Um, Tim Cavell, who I'm not sure who, if he's joined us now or not, but uh, Tim Cavell and I and several of his graduate students have um, kind of taken an interest in whether school-based mentoring might be of value to children who are uh, either engaging in the perpetration of bullying or um, for children who are victims of bullying at school. We have particular interest in interventions that are embedded in important social contexts at school. And so the intervention that I'm gonna discuss today is called the Lunch Buddy Mentoring Program. And Lunch Buddy was, uh, has an interesting history. I can't, can't spend uh, a ton of time on providing a historical overview of the program, but just know that Historically, the Lunch Buddy program served as a control condition in a larger intervention trial of a multi-component intervention for aggressive youth. So we had this, um, uh, Tim and his colleague had this multi-component multi intervention called Prime Time. It had uh, community-based mentoring uh, paired with um, parent and teacher consultation um, and social skills training for uh, aggressive children. The, uh, at the time, the school district would not allow for a no treatment control condition, so they had, developed, they had to develop an intervention that was acceptable, um, but maybe inert. Um, and so they came up with this Lunch Buddy Mentoring Program. And it was specifically designed uh, to, uh, uh, specifically designed in a way to dilute the, uh, the active ingredients of the mentoring intervention. So mentoring relationships, uh, uh, it was a three semester mentoring program. They swapped out mentors every semester to prevent uh, the relationships um, from growing in strength um, over time and in, 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 in quality. Uh, they were embedded in a noisy lunchroom to prevent um, kind of these relationships, uh, again, uh, from growing in strength or quality. Mentor, the mentoring was brief. It was 30 minutes, twice a week. And uh, the mentors were generally minimally trained. They were taught uh, to, um, they were trained in kind of appropriate school behaviors and they were encouraged to, to kind of talk to and, and, and have fun with the kids. And um, surprisingly, this Lunch Buddy program outperformed um, this very expensive multi-component intervention. So uh, children, the aggressive youth who are participating in the Lunch Buddy program relative to the prime time intervention um, were rated by teachers as lower in uh, aggressive behaviors. They had teachers rated them as higher in behavioral and scholastic competence. Um, and children were reporting a, a greater sense of school belonging and engagement. So. Um, so something was going on here. We have this, this really um, light touch kind of intervention um, outperforming this multi-component intervention. And so from here, um, we started to consider what might be going on here that, that might benefit uh, both aggressive and, and um, bullied children. We just wanted to take a second to welcome Tim Cavell. Thank you so much for joining us as a moderator. Tim is here with us from University of Arkansas. And we'll continue from here. Thanks, Martha. Um, so I wanna, 
I want to talk about some pilot data we collected for uh, on the Lunch Buddy mentoring program for both um, aggressive and, and bullied children. And so after this initial trial of the, uh, of the Lunch Buddy program, um, Tim and his colleagues and, and, and then uh, and myself started to kind of speculate, why might this intervention be useful for kids that are aggressive or chronically bullied? And you know, one thought was is that we're embedding these college students in an important social context. And these, these college students, when they go in to mentor these youth are um, honestly like rock stars. Uh, and so the thought is it, it may be improving the social reputations of both children who are aggressive and children who are, um, who are chronically, uh, chronically victimized. Both groups of children are often disliked by their peers. Um, it's also possible that mentors are promoting or um, promoting uh, more pro-social behaviors through modeling. They may be improving uh, peer interactions uh, between um, aggressive children and their peers. Um, or, you know, they may also be facilitating um, a youth sense of connection or engagement with their school. So we, we weren't really sure at this point what's going on, but those are some kind of theoretical speculations about why this mentoring program might be useful for these populations. So you'll see on the left side of your screen, there's, there's a, a figure that presents some results from an open trial of the Lunch Buddy program with peer victimized children. Um, so here we have uh, chronically victimized youth going through three semesters of mentoring. Um, and what we found in this trial is that based on both teacher report of victimization and child report of victimization, youth who were going through the lunch bunny intervention were, were decreasing significantly across three semesters of, of mentoring uh, and, and their victimization experiences. And so, you know, these results, these results again are, are promising. Uh, results for the Lunch Buddy program. Um, in a separate trial, so as a postdoc, I was fortunate enough to receive some money um, to evaluate uh, the Lunch Buddy intervention for uh, children who were perpetrating aggressive behavior. So these, these children had, uh, were identified as having heightened levels of aggressive behavior. Um, I uh, performed a randomized control trial, the Lunch Buddy mentoring intervention, uh, compared uh, the intervention to a no treatment or a wait list control condition. And so what I'm presenting here in the right figure uh, is some data that looks at uh, changes in children's social preference scores over three academic semesters. And so the first measurement occasion is the baseline occasion. Um, the second is at post-intervention. And the third is at six-month follow-up. And so you'll notice that uh, there's this nice linear decrease or linear increase, excuse me, there's this uh, increase, slight increase or stability in children's social preference scores who are mentored, but this linear decline in social preference for aggressive children who um, were in the uh, weightless control condition. And so it seems, uh, and this is, this is a nice finding because oftentimes you see for aggressive youth, that their level of peer acceptance deteriorates over time. And we're seeing that it's stabilizing and then relative to children who didn't receive mentoring, um, uh, excuse me, it's, uh, it's stabilizing. And then uh, in the, the children in the control condition, we see this uh, decrease in social preference over time. So Tim, I might let you jump in now and, 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 and uh, talk about some takeaways for mentors and mentoring programs. Thanks, Chris. Um, you know, I was uh, reflecting on the poll that Martha did earlier, where uh, there was at least a third that were unprepared or not sure. Um, and I, and it, what came to mind was a study that we did where we asked teachers about how confident they were about dealing with school bullying. And one of the things we found was that the teachers that were the most confident had kids, had classrooms where there was a fair amount of bullying going on. Uh, and so I think oftentimes we can overestimate our ability to manage this very difficult situation. I think it's more challenging than at first blush, uh, which is why I think it's really critical to recognize that a simple 
model of bullying is you know one or two bad actors doesn't really fit, uh, and that you want to you know if you want to ex explain why we have trouble addressing this problem, it's because um, uh, the rules against bullying tend not to apply when it involves someone who's not a part of our group. Okay, and so the first order of business in being uh, uh, in bullying someone is to get them booted out of the group, the social exclusion. And that's done through things like name calling, labeling, stigmatizing, uh, starting rumors about them, uh, you know, speaking ill of them. And so what happens is a, is a socially constructed story, if you will, about this person uh, that makes it very hard to refute. And so when you go to combat the bullying, it's not a single person. There's a collective action that's happening, uh, and it's very difficult to counter that. And so, uh, and then if you add on top of that, the child who's uh, or youth who's starting to fall into the role of victim, blame themselves for what's happening, have a fixed mindset about it ever, you know, in changing, then you've got a really wicked combination of things. And in terms of protective factors, the critical is social inclusion. You have to find ways to change the narrative, the social narrative about a child that's being excluded. And I think that's sort of what happened with Lunch Buddy Mentoring. Uh, we, we tried to water down the relationship by putting the mentors at the lunch table, but the mentors at the lunch table helped change the narrative about those kids. And so embedding a mentor uh, in a, a peer ecology, I think turned out to be serendipitously really important. Uh, the other thing that we uh, think is important is to try to promote more adaptive coping among those who are victims. Regulation of emotion, more of a growth mindset. Those are uh, critical factors. Now, for those who are engaged in bullying, uh, you, I think it's important to differentiate between bullies who are perhaps uh, well liked, because some bullies have fairly good peer status. Uh, and so if you're going to make an impact on those youth as a mentor, then it's gonna be really important to embed the mentoring within the peer group. You're gonna to have to be part of, at least at times, part of that, that youth's peer group so that you can uh, make an effort to, uh, to promote stronger norms against bullying and social exclusion. You know, uh, as a, uh, I'm not only, not only a researcher, I'm a, uh, a mentor. Although my, my mentee is now, today is his birthday actually, he turns, uh, 20 today, but we're still in contact. Um, but I often, uh, much to the chagrin, I think of my big brother's big sister's support staff, would hang out with him and some of his buddies because I wanted to be part of that network and be able to listen to what they talked about and, and, and comment and try to move them in directions that were more positive than negative. Um, now, there are some bullies that are more emotionally dysregulated, reactive. They're not well-liked. And these are kids that are having a, a tough time being accepted. And if they're emotionally dysregulated, they can be provoked and angered and lash out in ways that make them not only victims, but also bullies. And so promoting their regulation of emotions is important and, and finding ways to help them make and keep friends uh, is critical. So uh, for takeaways from mentors and mentor programs, uh, certainly a, a safe, inclusive, trusting relationship is, is sort of a uh, a precondition, an important precondition. Uh, I would encourage ment uh, mentors to help mentees find and interact with positive pro-social peers. You know, we tend to think about mentoring as a one-on-one -on -one activity, uh, that you do it apart from uh, youth uh, peer network. I'm, I'm personally not a big fan of that. I think there's so much action that happens when kids are with their peers. Uh, some of you who are parents might know about this, parents of teenagers. And if you want to have a conversation, you want to learn about your adolescent uh, child, you spend time with him or her and their friends. That's how you do it. Uh, so you want to use interactions involving ment mentees and peers to promote uh, norms that support social inclusion and discourage social exclusion and things like, uh, you know, identity bias or identity victimization, speaking <clears throat> in, in racist terms, uh, in homophobic terms. Uh, that those are going to be important conversation to have in those moments.
as is Samir is going to take this one. Greetings, everyone. Hope all is well. Um, just wanted to talk for a couple of minutes um, about cyberbullying. And again, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Tim. So a couple of things just in terms of setting the backdrop. We studied tweens, so that's 9 to 12-year-olds, a couple of years ago. And what we found was that about 15% have been victimized online in the form of cyberbullying. About 15% have seen it occur to somebody else, for example, a friend or a peer at school. And about 3% self-reported that they have cyberbullied others. So again, that's nine to 12 year olds across the United States. When it comes to teens, so we're looking at 13 to 17 year olds, we collected national data last year. And very briefly, I simply wanna say that it was about 23.2%. So about one out of four middle schoolers and high schoolers between the ages of 13 and 17 cyberbullied, sorry, were a victim of cyberbullying last year. We collected data previous to that in 2019 and it was around 17%. So it's about a 6% increase from 17% to 23%. But if you're thinking about that, it's almost a 33% rise in the prevalence of this phenomenon. Maybe that's due to COVID, maybe that's due to something else. Contributive factors and consequences, I'll be really brief just to point out that in terms of consequences, you all understand just like with bullying, we see outcomes such as lower academic achievement, higher instances of truancy and absenteeism as it relates to the school, we see psychological and emotional distress and disturbances. Um, we see, unfortunately, suicidal thoughts and attempts. Um, we also see this being tied to behavioral um, outcomes such as minor and moderate forms of school delinquency and school violence. Again, being victimized leads to that. And for contributive factors, we've looked at a number of topics and, and many others on, these on this panel have as well. For example, we recently published a, a piece involving the role of empathy and how that's so critical to cultivate amongst our youth. We've also identified how specific forms of parenting um, lead to a decrease in the potential for a child becoming someone who aggresses towards others. Happy to send you those pieces. We'll talk more about mentoring in a second. Back in the day, we studied deterrence because I was really curious, primarily because you would hear about these politicians and legislators all pointing to how we need more laws, we need more penalties related to cyberbullying. But when we study this across youthful populations, what we found is that you know, those legal consequences or even um, discipline in the school, that's the weakest deterrent. What actually are the strongest deterrents to reduce bullying and cyberbullying have to do with parents, have to do with educators, and relatedly have to do with mentors in terms of um, understanding that youth do care about what adults in their lives think about them. And they don't want to be shamed. They don't want to embarrass um, individuals that they look up to. And so if we can convey to them that, look, we are in your corner, we believe the best about you. Um, we, we know that it's difficult to navigate the, the travails of adolescent, but we trust that you can rise up to this high standard involving mature interactions, involving being able to deal with conflict in a healthy manner instead of freaking off and flying off the handle, then I think that goes a long way. So related to these protective factors, before I turn it back over to our team, I wanna to continue to emphasize the importance of building these climates um, in whatever capacity um, you work in, whether it's an after school program, whether it's you know, in school or, or whether it's on the weekends, you're a coach, you have some other platform with youth, continue to build a climate where youth know that they can talk to you about whatever it is that they're dealing with. We've heard that they're hesitant because they're afraid that we're going to freak out on them or make the problem worse or set them up for retaliation. But if you can just convey to them that you were available and do so in a non-judgmental fashion, not just with your words, but also with your tone and with your body language, then I think over time, youth will open up to you. I feel that they're surveying the landscape, looking for adults in their lives that they can open up to, that they can ask hard questions about what they're dealing with involving peer aggression, um, involving other forms of, of social difficulties you have to identify yourself as that person that they can go to. And then parenting overall, again, we have to be calm, we have to be reasonable, we have to be rational, and we have to be involved. Many parents and mentors are involved in youth's offline lives, but maybe not so related to their online lives. How can that happen more often? Perhaps I can suggest to you various sorts of, of tools and techniques, whether it's um, scripts to have a conversation with youth, whether it's questions you should ask, whether it's um, would you rather flashcards, you know, that game that we play, um, that one of my colleagues, Dr. Kristen Matheson, has, has created involving um, digital citizenship and being able to, again, broach the conversation in a relatable way with our youth so that then they consequently, again, open up to you. 
And then resilience building, that's, that's always gonna matter. You know, it's quick and easy for us to sort of swoop in when we have a youth under our care that has been victimized. And I think that is warranted without a doubt in many cases, but also since many forms of bullying and cyberbullying are mild, perhaps we should just sort of see what they can do, how they can negotiate this tension. Um, if they struggle, of course, we will swoop in and help them, but they need to develop various sorts of social and relational skills and a toolbox of sorts to deal with that conflict, because without a doubt, they're going to face conflict as they move on into adulthood. And then finally, very last point, and I thank you for your time. Happy to follow up with any of you as the rest of my team would offer that to you as well. SEL skills in the form of um, regulating emotions, self-control, being able to manage anger, being able to, to deal with conflict in healthy ways. We have to continue to focus in on that. And whenever there's the opportunity, whenever there's a teachable moment in a one-on-one -on -one conversation or in a group setting, our hope is that mentors seize that opportunity in order to convey these, these points. Okay. I believe this is me. Where so let's uh, let's meet our panelist. So uh, should I? Uh, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Wendy, you want to say hello? Good afternoon. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And Samir, hundred percent. I'm hundred percent what you just said. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, I know our entire team is is on the same page. Um, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I teach at FAU. I co-direct the Cyberbullying Research Center with my colleague, Justin Patchen. Um, and yeah, we're constantly doing work um, as it relates to youth and technology, youth and social media, youth and gaming, and now youth in the metaverse. Right. And uh, Wendy, you want to speak a little bit about what you do? Yes. Uh, I am a prevention uh, services coordinator for East and West Carroll, Ohio, Dayton, Ohio. And a big role in that job is I'm the director of uh, Camp Mariposa which is a national camp. It's a year round prevention camp for children who youth who have been impacted by addiction. And uh, I'll go into how we've created community norms and uh, atmosphere as Samir just mentioned that uh, can help minimize bullying. So thank you for having right. me. Nicole and Joe. Hi, my name is Nicole Calcutta. I'm the director of the juvenile hall program for the Boys and Girls Clubs of the North Valley. Hi, and I'm Joe Hale. I'm the chief operations officer for Boys and Girls Clubs of the North Valley. I've been with the organization 20 years and I'm just um, honored to be here today. So thank you, Tim. Sure. Well, let's start with you, Joe. I've got a, uh, what's the most important takeaway from your work on uh, mentoring programs, working with youth impacted by bullying? Well, Tim, I got four, I've got kind of four things I wanted to share with, with everybody in the group. And I think one is um, to not tell kids to ignore it or to just, you know, ignore what they're hearing and seeing. And, and, and I think that that's an important thing. Uh, we often tell kids that words don't hurt or they just need to ignore it. And I, I don't think that's really the response that we should have as mentors. Um, and so words do hurt you know kids get hurt and, and we need to be able to, to dive deep for them and, and I think the first part of that is listening um, Samir did a great job of kind of leading us into that discussion about the importance of listening to kids having a space where, um, where we have empathy for what they're telling us allowing that to happen and be and being ready and approachable when they do decide that they want to talk to us mm -hmm. um, I think another thing for us is is once we've listened to them is being able to role model for them what that looks like. How do we respond with conflict? How do we respond um, with, with bullying? How do we even put them through maybe some scenarios and things about how would they respond? So letting them kind of, in a way, kind of act out a little bit of what they would do um, and, and, and kind of talking through that process, finding out what's comfortable for them. I think that's a big part. And then the other thing is the power of youth voice in action. I think that um, our kids need to believe that when they do stand up and they do say something and somebody intervenes, um, that the likelihood of that bullying interaction is going to stop, or it's going to stop in that moment, and it may even um, stop altogether eventually. But they, youth need to feel that they're empowered and that they do have a voice, and that um, we should encourage them when they feel appropriate to say something, do something, step into it, and um, provide that action. All right. Anyone else uh, have some important main takeaways from your work? 
Um, I was going to say patience and consistency. Um, we're not going to solve the problem of bullying a kid is going through like overnight. So just having patience, knowing that eventually we're providing support and constant consistency, checking in with them every single day if we can. In my case, I can because I work at a juvenile hall um, and just providing them with support and giving us patients and them patients and knowing that like we're here to support them and provide them with encouragement that this will get better. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you worry about writing a check that can't be cash, you know, saying we're going to help you and it's going to stop. Sometimes we can't guarantee that. We can't. And I, I, t I tell we cannot guarantee that it's going to stop, but we can help provide uh, support when it's happening, uh, calling it out when it's happening, talking to them on the side, like spending time with them um, to help them work through the process and their emotions of when it occurs. Um, I, yeah, I can't, as someone who was bullied when I was getting it, it, it didn't stop. Uh, it, I can't promise that's not gonna stop, but I can be like, hey, I'm here to support you and provide you with uh, some experiences and stuff that'll help remediate the effects that bullying is calling, causing you. Yeah, and I, I'm was going to talk about this in a little bit when it was my turn for the one question, but um, Camp Mariposa is based around the seven C's of addiction. And, and what I love about the seven C's is that it really is applicable to any part of our lives. Um, so the first three is I didn't cause it, um, I can't control it, and I can't cure it. And of course, at camp, the it is the addiction for us. But you know, if we just think about anything in our lives, like what you just said, Tim, you know, how can we, you know, cash a check that we can't cash for them? Um, and so we really focus often on the what we can't control, but it, there's so much in their lives, our lives, youth's lives that they can't control, but then we can focus on the things that they can control. And, you know, in this, in this situation, like Nicole said, is um, walking alongside them, um, is something we can do that we can control, um, helping them know that we're there for them, that they're seen and heard. I think that is just a key. It's a key to everything we do at camp. And I know for mentors all across the country, um, we can't fix it for them, but we can be sure that we uh, help give them the tools uh, that they need to help their situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm wondering about uh, Samir's work on cyberbullying because, you know, we uh, for the for teenage youth, a lot of these dynamics, these uh, hurtful dynamics take place in cyberspace. Um, you know, we're we're dealing right now with the aftermath of yet another school shooting where there is the rumor about the, the, the youth having been a victim of bullying. And so I, I worry that mentors, by the time they start working with youth, this youth may have already experience a fair amount of alienation and hurt. And I'm just wondering if you all can talk about how do you how do you pull a youth away from feeling alienated, disaffected because of being victimized? As for anyone. I would just say it takes one relationship. It takes one conversation to convey that you meaningfully care about somebody else. Um, and so if we can have that, I, I'm sure Nicole and Wendy, you all have many sort of um, case studies of, of that happening where someone was really struggling and there was an inflection point or they turned a corner because of one meaningful conversation that was genuine and, and heartfelt. And so that's, that's my experience, you know, just making the time, being fully present, demonstrating that you care. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, Samir. It's almost like you're saying, if, if, a, if a young person is forming the view that the world is against me, everyone's against me, then that one mentor is an antidote to that. I think once you step in and show that, hey, I'm on your side, then you can slowly begin to show, hey, I, it's not just me. It's like every, there are other people on your side. Hey, your, your counselor, your teacher, uh, possibly friends that you don't actually talk to. Like there, there are more people on your side. So once you get in, you can slowly show, hey, there are other people around you that are also connected to that are on your side that can mm -hmm. bridge the gap. Right. Wendy, can you say more about the at the camp? What do you try to do? Yeah, I was going to say that it just goes along. Thank you so much, Tim. So at camp, we really create um, an atmosphere 
uh, a, a particular climate and culture, uh, starting with, with that safe space. We create that safe space where um, we have certain expectations and norms for that safe and positive space that all life experiences are accepted. Um, the, the kids that come to camp, they understand that uh, they have a strong sense of belonging and a strong group identity. Obviously what brings them to camp is their connection with substance use disorders in their lives, but that's not what keeps them at camp. What really keeps them at camp is that, that building of community that happens. And, and I just would really like to speak to that uh, real briefly because it's, it's, so, it's so key in what we do. And I think it can be transcended into all of our mentoring, whether we're doing group mentoring model or an individual model. Um, but we talk about my story and your story um, at camp, and we don't share each other's stories. And no one can question or change your story. Um, and we said earlier, everybody, I believe this wholeheartedly, that everybody deserves and has a need to be seen and heard. Um, and so that space is created. And, and when that's created, trust is built. And trust is what creates community. And I already mentioned the seven C's and the eight C as community. But when community and trust are built together, um, and the expectations are clearly stated that everyone belongs, that everyone brings their own story, that everybody is included. There's nobody excluded. And we do that in a lot of different ways. I do that from the beginning as a expectation when I interview campers, but then it is very intentional. That's, that's one of the things I would want everybody to take away is it has to be intentional. Building community, building trust, um, building relationships has to be intentional. Um, and so we have group norms at camp. We have a personal group agreement. Everybody understands that uh, they speak from an I statement, um, that everybody shares the air, everybody has the opportunity to speak. Um, we take responsibility for what we say and how we say it, and also what we do and how we do it. And then one of the things that I love that I learned from the National Conference for Community and Justice of Greater Dayton here in Dayton, NCCJ, is when a mistake is made, it's an ouch, and then educate. So we are all going to make mistakes. We're all going to have ouches, even, you know, in relationships with one another, but we're, gonna, we're not gonna shy away from it. We're not gonna pretend like it doesn't happen, but we're gonna, we're gonna address it. And I just know, because of obviously all of our experiences that with camp and campers, I run three cohorts, is that um, when you've built this kind of um, space, trusted space for uh, youth, where they have a sense of belonging and they know that they can go to not just one mentor, but multiple different mentors if needed, and their peers. I think it was Chris that had mentioned that earlier. Their peers are involved. We can help them uh, regulate. We do a lot of self-regulation and then help them learn how to communicate. Um, and it's been, it's been very successful. We've had situations of campers who have been bullied and those who have participated in that. And, and we've yeah. had success in how we've dealt with that too. It sounds like uh, there's a consensus that um, helping give youth a voice and hearing that voice is critical. And I'm, I'm, Joe, I'm wondering what sort of trends are you seeing in your program that are, is anything concerning you in terms of recent trends? Yeah, Tim, um, a couple of things. One, I want to provide a little bit of background on, on where we're at here in Northern California. Um, we have uh, one of the highest adverse childhood um, experiences uh, scores in, in, in California, ACEs scores. Uh, we've had a number of fires here. The Camp Fire, the largest fire in the United States, uh, happened locally about uh, uh, 25 miles from um, our headquarters here in Chico. Um, we've had other fires that have affected the area. And um, so our, our kids have had, and then COVID, you've had a challenge with COVID and people being in school and out of school and um, finding different ways to be connected, not necessarily having that social emotional connection at school and friends and teachers. So it's been tough. It, ha it has been a tough uh, couple of years for our kids and for us as adults. Um, and so I think some of the things that we're seeing is that uh, one, young people are um, 
not going back to traditional school. I think there's you're seeing a, a number of kids that are going uh, to alternative education. They're doing online schooling. Uh, they're going to uh, maybe smaller school communities, charter schools. We actually have one here at Boys and Girls Club, um, and, and their numbers and enrollment have gone up. Um, I, so I think you see um, kids not necessarily going back to traditional school setting or um, realizing that there's other options available. And I think part of that is due to bullying and just it's tough for our kids. The transition uh, for our kids going from elementary school to junior high and then junior high to high school is tough enough as it is. And so then you throw in all these other things that are happening uh, and, and kids that are learning how to be uh, it, with their social peers. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're seeing all this struggle and challenges. And so I think you have parents and kids that are both saying, you know what, we're gonna do something else. This isn't working out. Um, so I think that's one thing that we're seeing. Um, another is that in the groups that we sit in with um, student attendance review boards, SARB, uh, which is where we kind of work with youth and families that are uh, chronically truant uh, or uh, be have behavior issues, we're seeing uh, younger and younger kids being affected and impacted in this. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a school here locally that works traditionally with uh, junior high students um, that are basically have been expelled from, you know, the, the regular, you know, mainstream school. And so now we're seeing uh, fourth and fifth graders that are being referred to this school for expulsion reasons. And so um, I, I think those are two things that, that I'm seeing. Uh, and then the other part is just the... Um, you know, the younger, younger part, and then the, the difficult transitions and kids doing, you know, um, additional education options. Um, and then I think, you know, we're still seeing, when I talk to our kids about what type of bullying they're seeing or they're experiencing, a lot of it is the verbal um, uh, harassment, uh, social isolation, um, those types of things. And we're also seeing it from within their so-called peer groups. So even people that they may frequent with, it's not necessarily somebody that just, you know, comes out of nowhere, but it's people that they frequent within their social groups. Um, there's just a lot of challenge in those sixth and seventh grade, you know, um, kids where they're really challenged by that. Nicole, at, at Juvenile Hall, where you work, what, what's, what, uh, if you had someone show up and say, I'm, I'm going to mentor one of your youth, uh, and then that youth is involved in victim bullying or uh, being victimized, what advice would you have for the mentor? Um, advice I would have to show up. Ooh. Um, I would, like I said, like patience, because right off the bat, the kids aren't going to automatically trust anybody that comes in just right off the bat. They will give you a whole bunch of mess. They won't listen to you. It's just, <laughs> you gotta, you have to form the trust first before you can dive into like, okay, let's talk about the fact that you were being bullied by other kids or you're bullying other kids. Um, I, first off, you do have to establish trust. And I've been there for the past three years. Finally, I've got the, the consistency going where I can enter a pod and be like, okay, let's have a conversation. Go in the classroom. We're having a conversation and they can just, okay, we're going to talk to Nicole in the classroom and it'll be fine. Um, but yeah, trust and patience first. And then you can dive into the conversation. Okay. I heard what was going on as you were walking to the gym. Like what, what's, what's going on? Like how often is this happening? And then we can dive into the conversation where we'll play like 48 or something. Um, just, yeah, establishing trust and then you can work your way into having the hard conversations that they don't really want to talk about with staff or the therapist. Right. right. So, so Samir, I got a question for you. You talked about parenting and bullying. So um, what sort of parenting approach uh, seems to be best at responding to a, a person, a, a young person involved in cyberbullying? But, you know, any comments about what advice for parents? I know where this is about mentoring, but yeah, so with regard to parenting styles, the ones that have been shown in the research to really help um, raise decent human beings are absolutely applicable if we want to reduce bullying and cyberbullying and other um, problematic behaviors. We definitely want parents and guardians to demonstrate warmth and care. We also want them to provide a structured environment instead of a chaotic environment that, of course, involves rules and expectations and beliefs in the maturity of your child. Um, and then allowing the youth to have choices, what we call autonomy support, instead of always making the decisions for them, helping them to understand that you know, they have capacity, they have agency, they have 
autonomy to um, you know, make choices about the color of their room being painted or you know, what they're gonna sort of accept when someone is being mean to them, either at school, in the community, on a sports team or online. And then overall with regard to parents and guardians, I would say that many of them are, they're nervous about the technology aspect of it because they haven't necessarily grown up with these apps and games. Mm -hmm. But I really would want them to just take a step back and understand that, again, let's focus on these root issues, which we know are essential to um, you know, raising kids who are, are gonna turn out to be awesome adults. Mm -hmm. And again, that relates to empathy, that relates to resilience, that, develop, that relates to having a moral compass, which can shape their, their decision-making. It also relates to where their identity is coming from. If it's coming from peer perceptions, then they're unfortunately gonna be at the whim of what everyone says at school or on the social media app or in a chat. But if their identity comes from something much more stable, and I truly believe mentors on this call, you can help with this. If it comes from something more stable, such as the skill sets they're growing in, what their future is gonna look like, the character traits, which actually do matter in adulthood, even though in high school, it doesn't really seem like they do. Well, if you can keep reminding them of that, they'll get their identity from that, and then again, they won't be so susceptible to being on an emotional roller coaster mm -hmm. when it comes to what youth are posting or saying or um, mentioning about them. Mm -hmm. what, what advice would you have for uh, mentors who work with young people that may be showing some bias toward uh, youth of certain color or certain gender minorities, sexual minorities, uh, you know, who may be engaged because, uh, you know, if you're not, if they're not part of your peer group, you may be more inclined to bully that person. How do you promote empathy and understanding uh, with youth toward youth who are not part of their group. I'll take a quick stab at that and I definitely wanna hear from the rest of you. The first thing that I'll say is that unfortunately, according to our research, we're seeing um, an increase in hate speech and biased motivated offenses. So that's hugely concerning and we can talk about some of the cultural factors that might be contributing to that. But what I would say is that, what are we doing specifically in order to get youth to understand that they have more in common with people who seem to be different than they do that is different. You know, we have more in common because we're human, because we deal with the same sort of struggles. How are we sharing vulnerabilities? As Brene Brown talks about, vulnerabilities are what actually bring us together. But if we're all posing and posturing and pretending that we've got it all figured out, then that's not going to happen. So additionally, what are some ways that we can place our students in environments where their hearts will be softened or even broken? to some degree because they realize that, wow, this population or this community doesn't have what I have. I'm super fortunate or, hey, maybe I need to reach out for this person who doesn't seem to have a voice. I have a voice. They're clearly being attacked or harassed. I can speak up for them. Again, we want our youth hearts to be soft. And again, even broken in some capacity, I think that we might wanna protect them from that, but that's so essential for character development. Mm -hmm. There's one to comment on that. I will just notice a note in the in the in the chat. And Wendy uh, note in the chat. I like this take that uh, there's a role for leadership. If you can endorse, I, it would seem that if you can endorse the youth that you're working with to be leaders, then one then be leaders in a positive pro-social direction. Uh, so I love that comment, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, I mentioned earlier that one of our group norms uh, came from NCCJ that ouch and then educate. Um, they actually are coming to our teen camp this weekend and leading a uh, presentation on words matter, um, which is they do a lot of work within the community on building leadership amongst youth and giving them a voice and helping that us that the you know the community to know that that they you know again we can't control and cure what's happening around us but we can be a change we can be you know we can be the difference that that might need made and i think giving the youth opportunities to really dive into some of these topics that samir is referring to to give them the knowledge and the strength and to practice those things so that when they are in the community, in their schools, with their peers, they have some skills and, and a tool set to use. Um, because if we're not practicing those tools with them, then they're just gonna flounder when they're in those situations. Um, so it's interesting, the words matter 
uh, them coming to do that came out of some things that we heard the youth talking about at camp. And uh, my colleague and I both said, ooh, this is, this is something we need to address and we have the opportunity to help them grow in that way. So uh, Martha, I wonder if we should uh, do some Q&A at this point. Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, we do, we. I was trying to look in the chat for some some questions. I know there's been some that have come up. One, um, I know we wanted to hear about any any other resources or recommendations for resources beyond this conversation that any of the any of the panelists might might want to recommend to everyone who's in the room right now. Resources for parents. Resources for mentoring programs, mentors, mm -hmm. uh, program staff, who kind of want you know more support beyond beyond um, this conversation. Uh, well, they can certainly like Samir offered. They can certainly contact uh, myself or Chris if they want to learn more about our particular way of helping doing school-based mentoring for kids who are being uh, bullied. We're glad to provide some guidance. We've. Uh, I've had recent conversations with some folks about trying to implement that. So that's one possibility. And we can also um, gather some more resources and, and send those out as well through our email to all of you um, who have attended with the, with the PowerPoint slides from this. We do have a question that came through the Q&A. How do you handle a victim of bullying who is still dealing with some issues even after high school? Well, that's tough. Uh, so I, I'll take a stab at that. I, and I, I, I guess I offer that. I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I practice one day a week. And it is not uncommon to have uh, patients who might arrive with uh, longstanding issues related to this. And if it's not a peer being who it may have treated them badly, maybe someone else. And, and what can the phenomenon can manifest itself such that you cope with being mistreated at a time in your life where you're not maybe at your best in terms of coping, but you can lock into a pattern of coping that persists over time. And now you've got difficulty because the way you're coping is not as mature or as flexible as perhaps it should be. And so seeking help later on in time involves sort of looking for different ways to cope other than what you locked into rather early because of those early difficult circumstances. And sometimes that means dealing with reprocessing emotionally what had happened. So sort of going back in time and saying, let's, let's visit what happened and understand how you responded, how it made sense at the time. And now you, there are different circumstances, you have different capacities. That's typically how that, I, I would approach that. Thank you so much, Tim. And one more that came through from our audience. How can we as youth help the people around us who deal with bullying? Great question. I'm gonna let the panelists respond to that. Well, I, I'll jump in on that first. Um, how we as youth, I love that, that you're a youth participating in this. Um, I, for me, it goes back to some of the basics at the beginning that um, everybody has the need to be seen and heard. And so I think making yourself available and uh, using good listening skills with anybody that might be struggling, I think it's also important to notice if you see um, some behaviors changing. And uh, that's one thing that we've keyed in on with at camp is that when you notice somebody's not um, doing what they normally do or actually maybe acting out in a way that they aren't normally acting out. A lot of times that can, you know, show signs of, you know, um, uh, of depression or anxiety or, you know, a mental health um, issue, but it also could be, a, you know, a sign of bullying and just saying, hey, I just, I just want to check in. I wonder how you are making space for them you know, like including them and making space for them and what you're doing um, or your group that, that they're with. I think um, those things, because everybody has a need for belonging. And I think if you can provide that, that would be um, a good start.
Joe, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I do. I, I was seeing it. I think Samir had something in the chat. Was that you, Samir, that added something? You want to go ahead and elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I was just responding to Haley. She was just talking about how um, any recommendations on how to work with schools who are not actively taking steps to address bullying situations and support those who are being bullied. And I just responded, y'all can see it in the chat, but to summarize briefly, the school absolutely you know, has a responsibility to step in if there's a nexus to the school environment or if the rights of the student are being infringed upon. And so I hope that you know, you're able to talk to the right people in order to, to make progress in that area. Um, they absolutely need to make sure that students do feel safe and not just that, but moving forward, the student body needs to understand that, you know, there are certain behavioral standards and attitudinal standards that we uphold related to our mission statement, related to the culture that we're trying to build. How is the school getting everyone on board? How are they preventing instances of bullying and cyberbullying from happening down the road? There must be intentional steps taken. I understand that everyone is overwhelmed and they've got to deal with lesson plans and preparing for standardized tests, et cetera, but this is a priority area. And I would get others involved if, if you're not making headway with your school. Has anyone uh, come across, oh, sorry, Chris, I just wanna ask, is, if anyone knows of any information research about how changing schools can benefit those youth who might or bullied, I'd love to learn about that because I think that that, that is a common, common last resource for parents. And I think it can be beneficial, but we don't have any systematic research on it. So if anybody knows anything about that, let me know. Sorry, Chris. <clears throat> well, I was just going to make a comment. I think H Haley's question question is a, is a good one. Um, I know that we work with about 10 schools in our in our area, and <clears throat> it's really, it's not uncommon for me to hear from principals or ad administrators at local schools that bullying isn't really an issue issue in our school. And then we'll go in and do assessments and find out that 20 to 30 percent of the kids are reporting being bullied, you know, at a frequency of greater than three times a month or four times a month. And so they they're often not, you know, there's a disconnect between what the students experiences are and what the administration knows about. Um, and so I, I think <clears throat> Sometimes assessment can be useful. So, you know, we've partnered with schools and provided them with some data that says, well, and we've, and we've, we've assessed it through multiple reports. And so, you know, there, there's a disconnect between what teachers are seeing and what administrators are seeing and what students themselves are seeing. And I think we can, we talk about why that's the case and then, you know, kind of review their policies and procedures around bullying practices and, and how we can maybe, um, you know, obviously provide them with some praise for the things they're doing well, and then provide them with some advice on what they might be able to do differently. But um, yeah, it's a real challenge. And, and then clearly what Samir, um, Samir's suggestion is really appropriate. Uh, most school districts have policy statements around bullying. And so schools are, 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 are supposed to adhere to those policies and if they're not, that's a real problem. And, and so, you know, I think you can take it up with the district office for schools that are just completely resistant to addressing it. Well, thank you so much, Chris, Tim, Wendy, Joe, Nicole, Samir. Thank you all of you in the audience for joining us today. It feels like this conversation could go on. We could have an amazing conversation for, for so long beyond this. Um, so we will, you know, we will continue to gather resources and we'll be sharing out all of the information from this presentation with all of you by email. Um, all of the panelists have shared their contact information. So if any of you would like to reach out um, to any, um, to Wendy, Joe, Nicole, Samir, Tim, or Chris, um, you will receive their contact information um, with the email after this webinar. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Martha. Thanks, Martha. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks guys. everyone. I know.